paid 500,000 for it and then sold those lots for $100,000 each, I sold it for 3.1 million. I mean, that was a, I can't remember exact numbers, but I think we raised and did several deals by myself, kind of just using my own capital and so not raising money and then started slowly to bring in, bring in money. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Real Estate 101 show. I'm your host today, Patrick Donnelly. And with me today is someone I'm really excited to have on the show, Levi Bankert. Levi, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. This is fun. I'm excited to get a chance to dive in. I'm excited too. I was telling you, I was doing my research for you and you're one of the more interesting guys that I've, I've come across on real estate Twitter. I really had fun learning about your life and we're going to get into all the good adventures that you've, that you've done both in real estate and otherwise. But um, for those of you, for those of our listeners that haven't had a chance to learn about you, tell us a little bit about how you grew up. Did you grow up in an entrepreneurial real estate family? What was life like in your younger years? Yeah, so kind of traveled all over the place. I uh, grew up initially in Florida and then moved to California when I was 11. Um, family of, uh, believe it or not, missionaries. So literally my family, like we traveled all over, all over the world, kind of doing different projects. So lived in Taiwan for a year when I was young, uh, Philippines, Brazil, kind of just all over the place. So by the time I left when I was 18, I basically kind of had a, a very broad set of experiences and seen a bunch of different cultures, which definitely helped kind of shape how I think of the world and, you know, realize that there's kind of not one particular way of doing things, but that there's a lot of other, you know, options and thinking and mindsets out there that are, you know, vastly different kind of depending on where you came from. Were you homeschooled or were you in, in schools all around the world? I was homeschooled almost the whole time, went to school a couple of different, I think I did a year in fourth grade and then a couple, couple of times I would go for a little bit, but you know, I think 80% of it was homeschooled. And then when I was 15, I tested out, basically got my GED and decided I was done and didn't go to college at all and just literally started diving into business right away. That's amazing. So as a kid, were you always interested in business? Did you do any kind of ventures entrepreneurially when you were young? I did. I kind of always had different projects. I learned how to weld when I was really young and would build furniture and sold furniture. And when I was 16, I went and got a job at a, a mattress a store delivering mattresses and could just kind of dove in as, as early as I could. Yeah. That's awesome. So you, you tested yeah. out, a, you, you got your GED. Why did you decide not to go to university? Um, in hindsight, I wish I had. I think there's, and this is something that my wife and I have four kids and we always tell our kids, I think there's a kind of formative years of your life that are a good opportunity to, to learn, not necessarily just, you know, what the school is teaching you in terms of academics and kind of preparing you for a job, but it's, it's also just social dynamics and being on your own. And, you know, we, we dove in and, you know, certainly no, uh, I don't look at it as regret because I'm thankful for the kids we had. And, you know, my wife and I got married real young and are still happily married. She's amazing. Uh, 23 years later. Um, but you know, we both say we wish we'd kind of given it more time and had more time kind of to, to do what our, you know, we have two in college now and are watching them go through this just really fantastic time of life. We just kind of skipped, skipped right over and, and dove in. Where did you meet her? You, cause you got married, what, at 18 and she was a little yes. bit older, right? She was 21. She was 21. I was 18. We met summer camp actually. Okay. Nice. We were both camp counselors and got to know each other and got yeah married. And then on, just after our first anniversary, our son was born, our first. So where, yeah, where was that? The, where were you a camp counselor at? Um, in Chico, so Northern California. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I, was, I was living in San Francisco at the time, and she was living in Auburn, which is you know, a couple hours away from there. So Very cool. So when you guys got married, what were you doing uh, work-wise? Um, first job was building rock climbing walls as a welder. Oh. Awesome. And so would kind of travel around. And one of the first projects that was coming, I mean, these were long, you know, it was like a seven month, eight month long project. First one was in Sacramento. And so we actually moved there for that job. 
um, and kind of dove in right from there and actually ended up staying in Sacramento for 10 years. Did you ever climb at Mission Cliffs in uh, San Francisco? I so actually helped build Mission Cliffs. No way. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, and the, the one in Sacramento that we built, that I moved to Sacramento to build, was actually the same company that built Mission Cliffs, uh, built the one in, in Sacramento too. That's amazing. I lived off and on for three years in San Francisco and, and climbed a little okay. bit at Mission Cliffs. So. Okay, yeah. That was literally the first one that I started working on and then uh, built one of the big projects that we did was the one um, in Berkeley, which was also a, a, the same company did it, which was an enormous, enormous project over there. That one took almost a year. That's really cool. And so you were doing the, yeah. you were doing the welding or you were doing all of it? Like you were... All of it. Yeah. Yeah. It was my, it, my brother's company that was building them. And I was, I was pretty young at the time and was working for him and we were building rock climbing more. So what was your first, like, after you got married, what was your first entrepreneurial venture? Was it, I know you guys bought a home and, and fixed it up. Was that what That's you right. consider your first? Um, not necessarily. So we started a coffee shop that ended up starting having two locations and sold that. So we did that for about a year and a half, but the first one literally rented. I remember it was $900 a month for a, a old bookstore that was just a total mess. And I went in and, and cleaned it up and actually built out the whole kitchen for the, you know, whole counters and kitchen and everything that needed to be there. And it, didn't have a bathroom and put a bathroom in uh, to convert this old bookstore into a coffee shop. It's still, it's funny, it's on 21st and N Street in Sacramento. It's still open there. Um, and so literally I, I did all of that work myself. I did learn how to do the plumbing and electrical and everything. I mean, it took way longer than, than I wanted it to, but I think we ended up spending $20,000, most of which we'd borrowed from a, a friend's parents in order to get that built, but opened it and it was profitable from the first month, from the first month, actually, it was profitable and kind of built this thing up from scratch and felt like this was a, you know, fun way to do it. Meanwhile, after it got going, I started flipping houses on the side because we'd done real well on our first house that really wasn't intended to be a flip, but we bought it and uh, put some work into it and figured out how much it was worth and sold it. And what year would that have been? 2000 and some? That was 2000. Yeah. Yeah, 2000. Bought okay. Bought it in 2000. Yeah. And then you were doing the work on the flip as well. You, you Absolutely. and your wife, yeah, I was right? Doing, I was doing everything. Yeah. And she was doing all the design stuff and I was doing all the, you know, everything from drywall to plumbing and electrical and scares me to think how little I knew and how, I mean, gosh, I hope those, uh, I hope people who own those houses now aren't still finding things in the walls that I just <laughs> didn't know what I was doing. But. Was it a live in flip then where you guys were living in it as you were fixing it up? At first, we did a few of those where we would move in. Uh, some of them we only lived in for a couple of months, but then then started doing several, you know, sometimes we'd do three or four at a time and did not live in them. Okay. So, and how did that first, like, bite of the real estate bug, how did that, how did that happen for you? What, what got you interested in real estate to begin with? We walked into, so I... I I need to reach out to him again. I know he's still out there. There's a real estate agent named Brian McMartin. Um, we were living in an apartment and had seen this. There was a real estate office down the road. I remember my wife and I just walked into his office and he happened to be sitting there and was like, come on Aaron, sit down. You know, we're like, Hey, we want to buy a house. He's like, how much money do you have saved up? And we're like, uh, $2,000. <laughs> and so he found an FHA program, this thing called the Nehemiah fund that loan you part of your down payment and have it as a, a recorded deed. If you did sell it within a certain time, it would be, you know, you'd have to pay it back. Uh, and, and he literally just, he handed me, I remember he handed me the book, The Richest Man in Babylon and said, read this. I'm going to help you buy your first house. Let's do it. And I ended up working with him on, I mean, I don't know, we probably did 20 transactions together over wow. the years. Uh, it's, uh, he was just fantastic. Great. You know, <laughs> Taught me that. That's funny. We still use this even on some of our industrial deals. He taught me this trick to write a, a letter with your offer. So he's like, everybody else is just going to be submitting offers and, you know, take it, at, you know, by the numbers. And he would write this heartfelt, just 
tearjerker of a letter of why this family needs this property. It would sit down and we'd go through this thing together. And then he'd be like, we're sending it. And I guarantee you they're going to accept our offer. And I mean, several times we got properties for lower than the other offers that were submitted because of these letters he would write. And I, I still do it today. I love it. It's a great, it's a great tool. That's amazing. That is a good story. So you, you'll you use it like for an industrial property. People, you can pull on their heartstrings with a great letter. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's obviously a little bit less emotional, but we're, we're trying yes. to make us stand out. So we talk about, you know, deals that we've closed recently, capital that we've got available to do it, how this one's just right up our alley, what we've, you know, how, what differentiates us. And I mean, I feel like every offer comes with a story and the offer doesn't adequately tell that story. And so you, it's, it's on you, the onus is on you as the buyer to tell that story and you have to kind of get outside, you know, color outside the lines a bit in order to communicate that. That's great. I really love that. Um, you mentioned the richest man in Babylon. Was that a pretty formative book for you? Oh yeah. I still quote it. And I've read it a couple of times between like 18 and 21. And yeah, I, it was incredible. Uh, just a fantastic book. Did you have some other real estate related books that also kind of fired you up? I remember the, so I read the, of course, the, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then they, he did another one that's part of that same series called the Pitch Flow Quadrant. Yeah. That's but, my know, favorite I'm one. Sure you, it's so good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's, it's frustrating because he's, he's gone on to become uh, something that's totally different than what he started <laughs> as. And it's hard to kind of associate with him at all. But I mean, the fact of the matter yeah. is, is it was a really good book and it, yeah. it having, grown up in a family that was not necessarily focused on being entrepreneurial. We were able to kind of think outside the box. Uh, this helped me kind of reorient towards like, oh, there's actually a kind of a whole different way of thinking here that can kind of help you. You know, it's a shortcut. It, you know, you don't necessarily have to sit behind a desk in a corporate office in, in order to get somewhere. Yeah, I think Sean Sweeney had that same light bulb moment. He was considering law school and read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And he, he, I think he, you know, dropped his application to law school and, you know, started yeah. pursuing real estate at that point. So, yeah, I mean, it's kind of, kind of a book that's often mentioned on the show here. So, um, so Richest Man in Babylon, Cash Flow, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, anything else that, that was part of your real estate education early on? Kind of early on. Man, I read a lot of just textbook. I mean, I would even buy college textbooks mm -hmm. and read them about, you know, accounting practices and for all sorts of, uh, you know, my wife makes fun of me because I, I always have like the most boring stack of books. I still do today <laughs> sitting next to the bed to read. Um, but I feel like I've just always, you know, it's one thing that I, that not going to college, I, I, I kind of just realized I'm going to have to learn this stuff on my own. And so I've been, you know, I've read, I don't know, tens of thousands, thousands of books. I'm exaggerating the number here, but thousands of books over the last 25 years that have really helped shape and form kind of, you know, strategy and how to do things. And it's funny because I, I don't necessarily always agree. And a lot of times you'll find a book that's, that I just read what recently, who, not how, that started out fantastic. It's, it's out there. I mean, everybody's talking about it. It's kind of one of these like big business books. Started out fantastic. I actually really enjoyed the intro. It was a terrible book, poorly written, just the stupidest, uh, like recycled ideas throughout it. But the, the intro and the concept, like they just should have started. It's a, it's a book as many are. It's a book that should have been a blog post, you know, right. <laughs> and they turned it into a whole thing just so they could try to get a bunch of, uh, like, you know, consulting income off of the consulting group that they built out of it. But yeah, I, I I actually enjoy books, even if I don't agree with them, because it still gets me to think about kind of how, you know, variation of ideas and approaches are out there and some of them work and some of them don't. Did you do some other things for your real estate education? Did you take some classes at, I thought maybe like at MIT or something that you did? did that was... Yeah, I've done a course at MIT. I've done a bunch of different things over the years to kind of dive in and figure out was you know. that finance related? What was that class that you took? Yeah, that was a, a financial modeling, virtual real estate financial modeling course. I would suggest that to anybody. It's a, I can't remember how long, it's like a six month long, you know, it's a semester basically course. 
that they do open it's, it's virtual and they open it up to people who are not attending MIT. That that one is is fantastic. And I really think a lot of their stuff is yeah. free, isn't it? Like it's completely free to to take some of their that one's not some of their stuff is that one. I mean, you're basically just fully enrolling as a student, you know. Okay. And so I can't remember how much it is. It's a few thousand dollars, I think. Yeah. Very much worth it. Cool. So, so yeah. you did, you did the coffee shop, you did a second coffee shop. What was that yep. exit like? Why did you decide to leave that venture? Um, we were, I did not like, it was not the right business for me. I realized I, I was making a lot more money on real estate yet having to get up at 4am and make sure the coffee shop was open. It, it was my first employees and I still, still remember kind of mismanaging them and uh, I would kind of make up rules around people. I, I just had no idea what I was doing. I mean, I think it was 19 when it opened. So, you know, I would kind of make up rules around incompetencies and keep people for too long and let people go erratically. And you know, thinking back, it's like, wow, I, just, I don't know how that whole thing worked out um, as, as well as it did, because it was a, a fantastic business and we ended up selling it and that, you know, we had an exit after only owning it for 18 months sold it to somebody that was going to, you know, run a business there. And that worked out good. Um, yeah, it's a kind of interesting to think back. I would do it very differently now. <laughs> yeah, good but question. I'm sure it was some great lessons on managing people oh, and, sure. and hiring people and, and all of that. Um, how did you, how did you scale the, the, you were fixing and flipping homes? How, how did that scale up? Talk, talk to us about that. Started to find, you know, I remember I had a tile guy, a, power washing guy, an electrician, you know, I would start to realize like, oh, hey, I, you know, the first ones I could do on my own. And then I started to do more complex projects and realized like, I mean, I remember I had a, an HVAC guy that would put an HVAC, many of the houses I was buying were in Midtown Sacramento, built in, you know, early 1900s. So, you know, these were almost hundred year old houses. They had no air conditioning. A lot of times it was, you know, lead pipes that needed to be torn out. I had an air conditioning guy that for like $2,600 would put in a central AC system and a whole system in the house and would come in and do it in an afternoon. Like him and he had a couple of, you know, junior apprentice guys that would work with him. And so I, I kind of started to realize like, Hey, there's leverage to be had, you know, I'm, you know you're arguably adding 10 or $15,000 to the value of a house by having HVAC and you're spending $3,000 and doing it. And so the, these flips, I would try to get that timeline just shorter and shorter. And eventually it was, I mean, it was like five weeks from start to finish, sometimes down to the stud gut in that much time. At the time, building departments weren't as, you know, they weren't watching. And so I, I would never get permits on these things. I would just go in, clean them up, get them done, go out. And then there was one that was really life-changing. So found a, a house on five acres of land in West Sacramento. So just on the, across the river from Sacramento, it was actually really near the river. Uh, house was the most expensive listing that had ever gone up in the West Sacramento markets. It was like $880,000. Uh, but I figured out that the land was worth a lot more than that. And so bought the house. We actually moved into it. It was really funny. I mean, it was, this was, you know, six, 7,000 square feet or something, just a monster house that some doctor had built for him and his family. And we moved in there and had actually our second daughter had just been born before we, no, no, no. My wife was pregnant with her when we were there. Yeah, that's right. So we had one kid and we're living in this just, you know, massive house with pool and it was just everything. It was incredible. Um, and then we sold, so we lived in there for 15 months split the land into lots, sold the three lots off individually, and then sold the house, uh, paid 880, sold the lots for 850, and then sold the house for literally like within a thousand dollars of what we'd pay for the house. So in 15 months, we made, you know, over $800,000. And was thing. that, and it was was like, that life changing at that point for you? Were you able to do Oh, it? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I was doing these flips and making 30, 40, $50,000 at the time, but also spending a lot of time on it. So it wasn't, I mean, we were, we were doing well through that and had done, you know, decently well through the exit of the coffee shop as well. But, you know, it, it was always like, how long is this going to last? 
we still don't really know what we're doing. And then this was, this was the one that was like, okay, we've, we, we actually created something here. Did you, did you feel that way? Like you didn't know, like, I'm kind of making this up as I go along. I'm just learning as I go. Was that part of it for you? Oh yeah, completely. I mean, it didn't have a team, didn't necessarily understand. I don't know. I, I think at the time I probably had a little bit more hubris and thought I thought I knew more than I actually did, but there was still an element of, you know, we'll see how this, how long this goes for, but sold, sold that one. And then really the, uh, the money was somewhat life-changing, but the biggest life change was realizing that I could develop land. And actually it was a lot more profitable, the value that you create, you know, I mean, I, all I did, I, I sold that house and, it, you know, to the neighbors, it looked like we just moved in for 15 months and then left. They didn't know what had happened because I didn't actually go do any site work or anything. I literally just took one parcel and created four parcels and then sold three separate parcel numbers that now existed to buyers that were going to build houses that they, they did. The houses are there now and then sold the house. And so from the kind of neighborhood perspective, it doesn't look like you know, from the visual side, it doesn't look like we did anything, but there's a lot of value created. And so then actually in that neighborhood, I just started buying up everything that I could. There was a six acre parcel right across, like just almost across the street down the road that was vacant, bought that subdivided it into 31 lots, paid 500,000 for it, and then sold those lots for a hundred thousand dollars each, sold it for 3.1 million, owned it for nine months, rolled that, you know, and then just kind of kept pumping around. And so it started to kind of scale in terms of how big we were doing this and hired a team and started doing a lot more of these. So we would buy, you know, vacant land or land sometimes would have a mobile home park on it or something that we'd pay to move the residents out and we're going to buy out their leases and subdivide that land and uh, at first just sell off vacant land and then over time kind of got greedy and said hey we're selling this to home builders why don't we be a home builder so i actually bought a home building company uh it's a very small you know shop that brought that whole team on and we started then building houses on the properties instead of selling them bought was you know you go vertically integrated, you can do everything and have a lot more profit out of it. Uh, timing was terrible. Bought that home builder in 2006. It's had 400 and, I don't know, 400 and something lots that we were, uh, had, had a, actually at one point got an offer to sell all of them at just this. I mean, it was like $42 million or something. Could have walked away with a significant windfall there turned it down and said, Hey, we're building every one of these lots ourselves, uh, and started to, started to build them. First houses were towards the end of 2007. Uh, I think we had 12 or 15 houses or something completed in 2008. And then the banks just said, stop, like, no, you know, this is Northern California, which was one of the worst hit through the 2008 financial crisis and banks were just completely done when I mean, they were not, you know. They weren't even thinking about letting us continue to build these properties. And so without construction financing, you can't build houses. Even though we were selling, you know, we had some in inventory and had sold some and proven the, that they were profitable. The banks won't lend. The banks won't lend. You just can't, can't do it. So did you have a partner at this point or were you doing this completely on your own? I had a couple of key employees who were part, I brought them on and had given them part ownership, but it was, you know, it was me for the most part. And you were, how old would you have been at this point? 27. 27. Okay. So pretty young. Yep. Did you, how were you doing the funding? Was it, was the funding coming initially from those early windfalls of subdividing that first property or? Yeah. And then at a big network of private equity investors and banks and had that, at that point, not done any um, when I say private equity, I mean like individuals, high net worth individuals who were backing what we were doing, um, but not no private equity funds or anything, you know, nothing institutional. Yeah. I would later figure out how to do that, but it, at that point, it had not. Well, how did you figure it out from the private side? How did you approach individual investors that wanted to invest with you? What was your, did you write them a letter and, and tell them what you were up to? And yeah, I mean, started with, um, you know, started with kind of friends and family, 
And then that quickly expanded from there because we were able to go full cycle on several deals and prove that it was profitable. I mean, you know, in hindsight, uh, cheap debt is a, is a potent drug that everybody got drunk on or high on, I guess, in, in 2006, five, six, seven, eight, hard stop at the end of 2008. I mean, we, you know, we had Washington Mutual and uh, these other lenders basically just, you know, countrywide lending money to people who were not borrowers on properties that were not good properties. And that just kind of created this compounding effect where, where, you know, values could run wild, not too dissimilar to what's happened in the last couple of years. I mean, the, the COVID response was in hindsight. And I think the fed has finally, you know, figured this out was far too much, far too quickly and created a run up in values that should have been a red flag sign a long time ago. I mean, thankfully it's, it's, you know, we're, we're not experiencing that 2008 level kind of depression of pricing. We certainly are having some, but it's, it's nothing like it was back then. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, never a good idea to throw cheap debt into the market at large volumes. <laughs> I want to get into that in, in a little bit about your market views, about what's going on right now. But I, I first kind of yeah. wanted to ask you a little bit more about the home building. You're, you were super entrepreneurial. You had done the coffee shop, two of them. How, why did you saw, decide not to start your own, just your own home building business? Because you, you'd done the fix and flips. How did you decide to just acquire a home builder rather than start your own? The, basically, Micah Beginski, who was the one who'd been running his own business, doing that work was fantastic at it and it's funny he and i are still good friends I just texted with him a couple of days ago he still lives in sacramento i you know I, at that point i knew and already had a, a you know i can't remember exactly how many people i think we had 15 people on the team i had i had realized that i wasn't the expert at anything but i could kind of play the orchestra and yeah. let everybody know where we were going and i knew i needed expertise and micah was undoubtedly that and you know became very quickly a, a full partner in the business because he was fantastic at that. So I, need, I needed and always still do need, need good people around me because I, you know, I thrive on being the dumbest guy in the room. <laughs> do, do you kind of view yourself more as a, a vision guy? Like you're the guy that's creating the vision of where the direction is headed and then trying to find good people to implement that? Yeah. I mean, it's funny. We're just now working on implementing the EOS system and there's, you know, the entrepreneurial op- operating system, which is that traction book. And they have this whole distinction in there. They talk about of like the visionary and the integrator. And I'm not like, I'm not a good integrator, but I actually don't fully buy into that, that there's just kind of two totally separate people. I've learned that I have to, I have to slow down. I have to, I have to kind of be a part of the integration of ideas. Otherwise the, the, the two kind of Ideas and dreaming slips from reality and reality goes quite differently. And so I'm, I, you know, I enjoy my role, which is kind of a balance of both and then lean on just an incredible team of integrators who, who put, you know, the ideas into practice and, and make sure that happens and we're not, you know, making mistakes along the way. So that book was called Traction. Is that? Traction. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do you remember the author of that? Um. Do not. I don't mean to look put you on the spot here. I remember Brandon Turner, G- the Gino, w- Gino Wickman. That's it. That's right. Yeah. I remember yeah. ordering yeah. it years ago. I never got around to, I don't think I read a little bit of it, but uh, it's good. I, it's funny. We joke. It's like a whole cult around it. Cause there, you know, it's the EOS entrepreneurial operating system, which there are many out there. And at the end of the day, every business either has to create their own, which is incredibly difficult or pick one off the shelf. This is undoubtedly one of the best tried and true operating systems that a business can use to make sure that, you know, things aren't falling through the cracks, decisions are made quickly and efficiently, and that you, you're tracking kind of where you're headed and why you want to, why you want to get there. And, and, and it's, it's, it's not strictly for just real estate entrepreneurs. It's for no, any, no. any business, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know of, you know, small power washing companies that, that use EOS and huge software businesses that are doing a hundred million dollars a year in revenue of the EOS. So, and what yeah. were the two distinctions you made? One was a integrator and the other was. There's an integrator and the visionary is kind of how they describe it. 
Okay. And that, you know, they, they, and I think they probably, in my opinion, they oversimplify it. They kind of say that impossible for someone to be both and you can pretend for a little while and, you know, but you're really just not, you're one or the other. I, I read an article the other day that said that, um, there's a, in terms of founders, four to one ratio of people who identify as visionaries instead of integrators. And so then integrators are just this like really scarce resource that, you know, it's hard to find or doesn't exist out there. Um, my argument is, is that everybody needs to be an integrator. You got to be the grown up and, and do what needs to be done. But then also certain, maybe, you know, and I think the, it's probably true. Very few great integrators are also visionaries. A lot, a lot of times that, you know, the engineer of the business can't really think five years down the road very well and dream about where they want to go. And so maybe that uh, on that side, it's true, but yeah, it's fascinating stuff to think about. Did you know that we have an awesome free investing newsletter in addition to this podcast? We have over 30,000 people reading the newsletter daily. So some of you are already subscribed, but that's a lot fewer than the 100 million podcast downloads we've done to date. If you're one of those 99,970,000 people who have listened to our podcast and aren't subscribed to our newsletter, join for free today by simply clicking the link in the pop-up on this video and then entering your email. In just five minutes a day, you can stay up to date with what's going on with your money and the financial world. Join over 30,000 other readers now by simply clicking the link in the pop-up in this video and then entering your email. I'll, I'll have to check it out. I've got it on my bookshelf here. I, I just haven't, it's just been collecting dust recently, but now that you've mentioned totally it, I'm going to, I'm going to pull it out. I'll pull it out. <laughs> totally sure. worth it. So, so the music stopped around 2007, 2008. What happened with those 400 lots? How did you unwind that? Um, incredibly painful. Uh, you know, a lot of money was lost and I am forever grateful for the equity investors who, you know, by and large rallied around me, uh, you know, one, one guy in particular who is still actually one of our biggest investors today, he's my, you know, if we, if we've got a deal that needs to close real quick and I need a million dollars, I'll call him up and he, he, you know, who and his wife travel everywhere. now he'll wire the money and be like, hey, we'll, we'll document this thing later. Totally trust you. It's fine. He lost several million dollars in my projects back then. And, and immediately just switched into mentor mode and was like, Hey, how are you doing? You know, this was, I knew that in the market who, you know, were operators that I had had lunch with and met and, you know, we're, we were doing deals together. This was just a, you know, just once in a generation, hopefully we don't have it again in our generation kind of tragedy that hit. And I just am incredibly thankful for the people who, who, stepped up and said, Hey, it's more than money here. What can, what can we do? How do we, how do we work through this? And they helped me figure out how to negotiate with banks. And, you know, for the most part, just negotiated short sales and, you know, almost always was just a total wipeout to equity investors, which is, you know, frustrating and tragic to the extreme. Yeah. What do you attribute their response to? Like why, why? Cause a lot of investors were obviously fear, you know, you'd be Furious at, yeah. at how things, you know, losing a couple million dollars. Why, why, what do you attribute their response to towards you too? I mean, I, that's not to say there weren't, I mean, there were some people that had put money in that, you know, put $50,000 in and it was a total white. I'm just pissed. I mean, I, rightfully so. And some of them I just never heard from again. It's like, you know, we're done. Mm -hmm. This is terrible and it's all on you. And I'm sitting here trying to explain what's, what happened and why it happened and how it all went. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'd like to say it was something that I did. I, we certainly, me and the team were extremely conscientious about over communicating everything. And from day one, and I still do this today, all accounts are open books. It, every, anybody who wants to see what we're doing, happy to come and look, you know, come in, we'll sit down, we'll give you, you know, here's the QuickBooks file. You can go dive in. Um, just over communication is key, but I don't think, I, I don't want to take credit for it because these are just some incredibly good people that, that were caring and had been through it themselves and said, Hey, we, we're smart enough to know 
you know, when the bank stops lending and you've got debts on a, on a building or on a property that has no income, there is no kind of magic that could make that undo. Um, and, and I always point to, I had an offer from, it was an international group, wanted to buy our whole portfolio. I sold them one property only and not the rest. Um, and it was one that I just kind of didn't love and didn't want to develop. Uh, their offer in, and this was like early 2008, their offer came through. Um, it was at a value that would have put my total debt on my portfolio at 63%. And so I would have walked away with, you know, 37% of the total value. And this was a, you know, 400 plus lot portfolio that was selling, I can't remember exact number. It was around $140,000 per lot. So it was an, an enormous offer. And this, this group had was buying other things and would have taken the whole thing down. Um, and we could have just walked away and, you know, so there, there, my kind of extrapolation from that is we had a really safe loan to value ratio. We were not over levered. Uh, you know, we just didn't see, and I'm, I'm not trying to blame innocence. I mean, I, I think now I probably have a much more attuned ear to the tracks in terms of what's going on in interest rate markets and have even safer deals set up. But I mean, it was, it was devastating. And I, and I knew of very few people that weren't a total wipeout you know, in that specific market we were in. What other lessons or takeaways inform how you now operate Harbor Capital from that, the lessons that you picked up in 2008 and how do you do things today that affected you back then? I mean, one of them is, is continue to over communicate. I kind of had a hunch that that was a good idea and, and probably didn't do even as much as I do today. We, we, we send out monthly updates. We share the bad news first. We're, constantly talking about kind of where the properties are at and what's what you know what could go wrong and what the what you know what we're seeing in the market and where we missed it and just be completely open honest and transparent the other thing is just a, you know, massive reserve funds we bought a 10 million dollar vacant building recently just because we know they're you know we've done it at a fantastic price it's far below what its intrinsic value is and, but it's vacant. So we had to go lease it and we put year, multiple years of reserves aside. We're just extremely cautious and careful. And, you know, I just kind of don't take the risks that, that I feel like at the time I might've thought were okay. And now it's just like, Hey, you know, we should, the future is completely unknowable. Nobody's predictions are correct. Despite this revisionist history in us, you know, going back and, and elevating Michael Burry and saying he knew exactly what was coming. He was a very, very, very rare person. In 2008, every developer, every real estate person that I knew was talking about how we were in the, you know, fourth inning of, a, of the game and we had a lot of time left and this, you know, this wasn't going to stop. It, yeah. wasn't, it wasn't readily apparent and obvious that things were going to change and certainly not to the degree that they did. As quickly as they did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you see any, any similarities today to what happened back in 2008 that concern you? Debt got too cheap too fast, and so did quantitative easing. Kind of alongside it, put a lot of money into the market that shouldn't be there and going to have to pay the price for it. I, I mean, one of the few that thinks the Fed is actually doing the best they can now. I don't, I think, I think they got us into this problem, but I also think that, that, you know, pandemic was such an unknown and to overreact was better than to underreact. If you had sat down, you know, in March of 2020 and looked at the kind of expected outcomes, what as good as things got 12, 24 months later, was wouldn't even have made your any economist top 10 lifts of the most likely scenarios of how we're going to come out of this. It just was wildly, you know, good for everybody, but it also was too good. And I think we need to pay the price for it now. And I also think that they, you know, they've got to get inflation under control. I, I question anybody who thinks they know what's coming next. So I don't know what's going to happen in real estate. I, you know, 
housing and whatnot, but I do know that um, those who are really cautious and do really safe deals are tend to come out on top. Mm-hmm. Right. So yeah. I wanted to to jump next after 2008, you took a little bit of a breather and regrouped. Talk to us about what happened next. This is a pretty interesting part of your story, I find. <laughs> so I said this earlier, bears repeating, I, I married extremely well. Uh, my wife kind of looked at me and looked at the, the, you know, disaster that had unfolded in our life. I mean, I was a, a, an emotional wreck. I, yeah. my, uh, business partner, you know, one of the, one of the kind of high up business, one of the high up employees who really was a partner in the business, good friend of mine had to lay him off, um, a couple of weeks after actually four days after I laid him off, went into the hospital with a liver failure and died. I mean, it was just, uh, he was, you know, he knew he had some liver problem, but didn't know how bad it was. And yeah. It was hard not to look at that and be like, hey, the stress of the situation that I created put this on him. And, you know, that was just gut wrenching. Yeah. And so it was just this like deep, dark time in life. And my wife was like, let's go do something different. Let's, let's go reset. And we were, you know, I remember talking about maybe it was for six months or a year, but we moved to Ethiopia to basically go, we'd heard of a situation where there were some kids that needed an orphanage created around them. And so we, we launched a 501c3 in the U S moved to Ethiopia thinking this will be a, you know, side adventure thing that we'll do for a little while. Um, got over, it's still running today. It's a massive organization with a couple hundred kids in two different, two different cities in Ethiopia. We're not, um, as of about a year and a half ago, we're not involved anymore handed it over to a new director but just you know fantastic got this thing all all up and running really challenging season it was a tough tough thing to take on but proud of the work that we did but we ended up staying there for six years so our oldest was eight and our youngest was two at the time we moved there so we had three kids and then we ended up adopting a fourth while we were there um and so our we didn't move back until our oldest was going into high school Wow. And so the, and so, the nonprofit was, you were, were you pairing up orphan, orphan kids with widows? Was that the kind of the premise yeah. of it? Yeah, exactly. So basically working in the local communities, there were many widows who, you know, husbands had passed away. And unfortunately, culturally in Ethiopia, you're kind of shunned. Like, it's like you, you just, it's over if your husband dies. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we were able to basically take them, put them through a training program and then put them in a house with you know, five or six children who we'd taken from the government orphanage, uh, which was just a, you know, terrible situation. I mean, the government orphanage would, they'd scoot two bunk beds together and sleep five kids across the top and five kids across the bottom. And I mean, it was just a heartless place. And so we were able to take those kids out of there and put them in, you know, what, but closely resembled a family. And it's neat to see, I mean, now several of the kids have, have graduated from college already. We've got a doctor and an engineer and like, it's really neat to see that like it actually works. It's a system that works. That's amazing. So you got back to your missionary roots. Was that something that you'd been wanting to do when you were back in the States where you're like, I want to get back to, no, <laughs> no, I think certainly not. I mean, it was something that my wife always wanted to do and she was fantastic at it. it it's a, you know, throughout the, the, gosh, 10 years, I guess, that we ran that organization because we ran it. So we were there for six and then ran it for another four after moving back to the U.S. Uh, throughout that 10 years, I mean, I raised six mil, five or six million dollars for the project, both operating costs and built buildings and, you know, I mean, just the whole thing. You know, we were paying for college and everything for all the kids. Um, it's a, it's a, somewhat similar skill set to doing real estate, but also just not me and not my, you know, so my wife did most of that and was fantastic at it. But you, you also started what, three or four different businesses while you were in Ethiopia, separate from the nonprofit. Yeah. So I was pretty much exclusively focused on the nonprofit stuff for the first two years, but then the last four years that we were there, I started uh, several different businesses in Ethiopia that are still going, actually sold. Um, I sold my shares out in 2019 of those businesses, but 
Yeah, it was we were the um, largest beef producer in Northern Africa. Had a, a three thousand acre uh, beef feedlot operation where we were growing our own corn and had at the peak had three thousand employees there. Um, and so, yeah, started that from scratch, literally like went to the, the prime minister and got him to, to give me land to build that on. Uh, started a real estate development business there, uh, builds apartments for the U.S. government kind of all over Africa. So um, when I left that had a, a significant pipeline of properties under development, um, these were you know, 100 to $150 million apartment buildings that we would build. And lease, you know, as soon as they were done, they would be leased to the U.S. government for staff housing. So were you partnering with with business people in Ethiopia? Were you partnering with, it sounds like the U.S. military was a benefactor. Like, talk to us about that. How how was it do, doing business in Ethiopia? I've got to believe it was complex and a lot of hurdles. I always felt like I was born 100 years too late. I, I have. <laughs> went through this season of life where I was reading like you know, books about Rockefeller and uh, Vanderbilt and like just fascinated with kind of how things were. Ethiopia at, at the time and, he, and lesser, lesser so today, it's developing so quickly, but it was, it was cowboy country. You could make the rules and, you know, which is a good, good and bad. It allows for developing things really relatively quickly kind of scaling quickly because they, they, they basically just hadn't seen this before and were happy to, to be a part of it. And it was fun to, you know, literally just go, um, I had never met the prime minister, but knew we needed his sign off in order to get that piece of land that I had found that the government owned. And I, I went and showed up every day for weeks at the little guard house outside the prime minister's house and would just wait there with a presentation. And the, the guards would just laugh at me. You know, I, I barely spoke any Amharic and they sp barely spoke any English. And, and every time I'd leave with a new, an updated letter, I would update the presentation. And be, you know, here, here it is again, here it is again. Finally, there's a stack of these on his desk. And the prime minister told them when I showed up, let him in, I want to talk to, I want to talk to this guy. <laughs> you know, that would never happen here. You also wouldn't need the prime minister's signature in order to start a business in America either. But, you know, it's kind of an interesting interesting place that said i feel like i'm doing business on in, in easy mode now here back in texas it's a lot simpler to get stuff done here i bet i bet so you became the largest beef producer in ethiopia is that right yeah in northern Africa, there was one beef feedlot in south africa that was bigger than i'd in all of africa um but we yeah we were a massive massive operation and yeah. it's incredible i love this i yeah. love it i love it and so raised, raised money from the Norwegian government was one of our big investors, a bunch of different private equity funds, all these kind of ESG focused funds. I mean, that was a, I can't remember exact numbers, but I think we raised 55, between 55 and $60 million to get that up and running and off the ground. Did your experience in 2008, were you shell shocked at all? Were you leery of starting another venture or were you just like, I'm going to do this. This is like what I'm made to do. What, what was your thought process? It took, it took two years, but really doing that nonprofit and also spending that time just connecting as a family. And I mean, some of our kids' best memories are our time as a family that we spent, you know, we literally lived in a house that was, that had mud walls in Ethiopia. Our water would be off for weeks at a time. And we had to, you know, figure out how to store water and the electricity was very rarely on. And I mean, it was yeah. just a complete, you know, shock to the system. Yeah. I, and, and I think helped me get back to like, okay, I do want to build big things and I do, do know what I'm doing here. Um, but yeah, it was, it was certainly tough and I kind of went into it slowly at first before, before scaling. You mentioned some of the biographies you were reading. Which one was your favorite? I read Titan a few years ago, the Rockefeller, yeah, uh, Ron Chernow book, which was amazing. I love Titan. Yeah, yeah, that one was really, really good. Uh, the Cornelius Vanderbilt one is good. Yeah. And I'm blanking on some of these others. Um, yeah, Titan, Titan was one of my favorite, though. I loved that book. I saw an interview that you did another podcast and you were you had it was your bookshelves were in the background and like the front, oh, yeah. the top row was all biographies i could tell it was like titan and 
I think there was a Richard Branson one, Shoe Dog, yeah, the yeah, Phil Knight, yeah. which I'm excited yeah. to see that movie, the Phil Knight uh, era. I, I think it's not called... good, that looks really fun. Yeah, yeah, very cool, very cool. But um, yeah, that's cool. I'm gonna have to. I haven't read Vanderbilt. I'm gonna have to go check that out. It's so, good. Yeah, it's yeah. very good. Nice. Yeah. Um, what? Why? How was it coming back from Ethiopia? Was that a like reverse culture shock for you guys? Yeah, it was. It's funny. Our kids acclimated moving there, partly just because they were young. Moving back, I mean, it took a couple of years to adjust. It was hard for my wife and I, and it was hard on the kids. I mean, they felt like they were aliens coming into, I mean, we put them all in a small private school. All four of them went to the same school and they would come home at the end of the day. And I mean, it was tears. There was always somebody who was having a like existential crisis. Yeah. They felt so much like an outsider. That was a really tough transition that took, took a long time. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I lived a couple of years in, in Vietnam and had the same experience coming back. Mm-hmm. The acclimation, acclimating there was no problem, but coming back was like, yeah. I don't know if I belong here anymore. <laughs> yeah. 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 People so, who kind of were friends, you just don't have that yeah. ability to connect in the same way that you did. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So uh, let's get into Harbor Capital. Yeah. You, you're back in the States after six years in Ethiopia. At what point do you start Harbor Capital and how did that, how did that come about? Why did you decide you moved to Texas? Talk to us about how all of that unfolded. Yeah. So moved to Texas because the businesses that I'd started in Ethiopia was with a, a partner and he lived here. And so basically we decided this was going to be, you know, global headquarters for that business. Um, and so, uh, you know, we loved it. It's, it's been a great, you know, Austin is a good place to raise kids. It's a great, great spot. And our, um, two of our oldest two are in college and they're staying here. They're going to UT Austin right down the road here. So everybody's like that. Um, yeah. So I, you know, basically sold that business pandemic hit, was trying to kind of figure out what had researched a bunch of different businesses. I'd been an LP investor in deals before and had a good friend of mine, Jake, that lives in Boulder. That's a, um, a very similar, he runs a very similar legacy capital partners. It's called a very similar business to Harvard capital. Um, much more, he's kind of much more diverse. He does apartments and hotels and some industrial. And I, I, at one point, actually, he brought me on as a consultant for a little while to come help with some HR things and get some structure and put some vision together for the business. And looking at it, I remember telling him like, this is a brilliant business, but there's one part of this that's like, very and that's these industrial deals the triple net leases properties that you get to own and just there's not a lot of work to do with them that's the that's where i wanted to be and so um i basically started harbor capital in early 2021 did several deals by myself kind of just using my own capital and so not raising money and then started slowly to bring in bring in money uh from outside lps and so we work now with about 1400 um, LPs on our list to accredited investors. Um, we have just over, I think it's like 1.1 million square feet of industrial properties that we own. Um, so this is all since 2021, we've scaled pretty quickly about $135 million of value across the portfolio. Uh, for the most part, buy and hold, we've gone full cycle on a couple of deals, but that's not our, that's not our preferred strategy. So we buy you know, class B industrial in a couple of markets that we know well. So San Antonio and Houston, um, we're, we've got an eye on Austin in the DFW area, but those markets, just the economics don't make sense as much as San Antonio and Houston do. We're looking for Brenway and places where we can do extremely safe deals, put together massive reserve funds, just make sure, make sure that no matter what happens here, we're in a good spot. What's an ideal acquisition look like for you? Um, we've made a lot of money buying vacant properties and basically negotiating the heck out of the purchase so that we know that we know that we know we're getting the best deal possible and then leasing, you know, being patient and leasing it to, uh, you know, uh, best is for, and we're negotiating one right now that I'm really excited about where best is when we can lease to a publicly traded company on a long-term stable lease. We add significant value 
by doing that. And then just to, you know, relatively light tenant improvements. Sometimes we just give them a tenant improvement budget. We're like, here's a hundred thousand dollars. You can do what you want to the property. You know, a hundred thousand dollars, maybe a free rent or something. Um, but yeah, th that's, that's for the most part, our bread and butter. We do multi-tenant and single tenant properties. So well, do you prefer single a single well. tenant? I do from a, a simplicity standpoint, you kind of have this big, push where you go get it full and negotiate and then you sit and, and we have one building we bought at the end of 2021 sat vacant for seven weeks and then leased it to a government entity and they just you know i i, I don't think actually i have not been in the property since and they're you know 17 months or something into their lease um they take care of it and they pay us rent and we're at a fantastic cap rate where if you buy something stabilized you might buy at a you know, today might be a seven cap. Uh, we're, you know, we're often able to stabilize at a 10 by just taking that initial lease up risk. And if you know, I mean, we always joke, I mean, we're, we're an inch wide and a mile deep into the markets that we know we, we don't know, you know, somebody asks me about a, you know, what do you think about this hotel investment? It's right in your neighborhood. I'm like, I have no idea. I don't, yeah. I don't know. You know, should you buy this Starbucks? Maybe, I don't know. It's a good deal. I don't know. But if, you know, if you want to talk about some, you know, vacant building in a, in our neighborhood, it, it's an industrial building. I, we know everything there is to know about these buildings, you know, very, very little do we buy, very rarely do we buy an asset that we didn't already know about for some reason or another. We're always just kind of trapping what's out there in the market. So 2021, you started how, and you've got what, 135 million roughly yep. of, of real estate. How did you manage that and scale that kind of growth? How did you manage that kind of growth so quickly? Um, family office connections really helps a lot of, you know, kind of super high net worth, 100, 200, 300 million dollar uh, connections that are trust. And here's what I know how to do and trust the vision, uh, just over communicating. And then you end up with word of mouth. And so, I mean, uh, I think right now we have about five times as much equity capital available as we do deal flow. Um, and that's, you know, just this very basic formula that gets you there of, of doing what we say we're going to do. We always under promise and over deliver in every possible way that we can. We avoid capital calls like they're the plague, you know, <laughs> and over, over capitalize deals right from the front. And you end up with, I mean, it's funny, we had an investor recently that um, did $50,000 into three of our deals. And then, you know, it was just, we'd done call, I'd done calls with him, asked him a little bit about his work and, you know, he talked a little bit about it, but I did not like kind of understand that there was a lot more money there and that he was really just trying it out and got to the, the end of the third one. And we had a deal come out and we called us up just last month. It was like, Hey, I want to $10 million into the next one. Let's go. Get it. <laughs> Which is fun. And his initial investments were what, 50 or so thousand? You yeah, thought $50,000 into three deals and then $10 million. So that's awesome. Yeah. You talk, you speak really highly of your team on, on Twitter. How have you gone about like finding and attracting top people? Um, you know, I don't think there's a science to it. We have a fantastic team, but we've also had to let some people go that just didn't end up being a fit. And sometimes we had to let people go because the business changed so quickly and they were great for where we were and not great for where we're headed. I always, Michael Girdley and I talk about this, have talked about it a few different times that like, whenever someone says the, the business is a family, it's a red flag because it's not a family. Like you can't fire your family, but you can fire a, a you know, team member who's not taking the team to where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. Um, that said, man, we have landed with this core team of people now who are just the best of the best. And I, I'm, I, I really believe we can scale the next five years with this core team and that's just fantastic. And I love it. Yeah. It's been really fun. That's really awesome. What, how do you align your, are you investing in each deal? Like, are you, are your incentives aligned with the LPs? Yeah, we always put um, money into every deal that we do and as much as possible. Austin, that's 10% of the capital that's raised comes from Harbor Capital. Okay. Yeah, we 
try to try to make sure that we're we're aligned as much as we can be. I don't know if you know much about our podcast, the Investors Podcast, but we we started with um, it, it was called We Study Billionaires, and you know, studying Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, and I saw you mention that Howard Marks, who's a you know pretty famous yeah. value investor, is now getting in, involved in Texas industrial real estate. So, yeah. It's so the, to the vein of my existence, my existence. I mean, literally, we're we're in contract on an on an asset right now that we found off market, and we always go do you know kind of who are our neighbors and go figure it out. And there's a mirror asset that's not directly across the street, but, but a little bit down. You can see it from our property that was closed in December of this last year and was Howard Marks, you know, this oak tree capital. Oak tree, yeah. it's, a, it's a little scary because. Um, you know, I, on one hand, it's a validation of our thesis and it's sure. great, but man, the amount of capital that they can put to work is just, um, yeah, staggering. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted yeah. to switch here and talk about your short-term rental that you built and the tiny house also. Are, those are two, those are on the same property. Is that right? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. That project. My wife's kind of fun project that she's done. We bought almost two years ago now a property in Wimberley, which is about 40 minutes outside of Austin. Um, cute little town that's got a downtown with the river that runs through there and restaurants and stuff like that. It's a great, you know, if you're in Austin and you want to get out, like this is really the closest little vacation town outside of, outside of town here. Um, we bought in, gosh, I can't remember what year it was. I think it was Anyway, two years ago, just about two years ago, uh, so yeah, 21, bought a, a house that really needed a lot of work and it took us a year to rebottle it. My wife, it's her little passion project that she has on the side. And we've got this contractor that him and his two sons are work out there all the time, completely remodeled the house, put a swimming pool in and then put that on Airbnb and it's done extremely well. I mean, it's, it's constantly full and price. Price ranges from like six hundred to two thousand dollars a night, um, and so it's on ten acres. And then it's weird, so it's kind of a hill, and the, there's a quarter mile driveway that goes up. We basically put a second driveway in, and are now working on this tiny house, which has been a fun, fun little side project here. Um, it should be done. I don't know. It's been it's been six weeks away from being done for the last like ten weeks. So we'll see. We'll see if it really is six weeks away from being done. But it's getting pretty close. And they, that'll be a just, separate, that'll be a separate rental from the, the main complete, house? Completely separate. So the, the main house sleeps 11. So the main, I, you know, the idea there is it's kind of, you know, families or girls get away a guy's trip or whatever. Uh, this is, is you only, you know, it has one king size bed. That's it. And so really this is competing with like the high end hotels in Austin. It's on the side of a mountain. So there's just beautiful view. Um, I say tiny house. I don't know that it exactly qualifies. It's like 650 square feet. Okay. Um, but it's a, you know, kitchen, living room, dining room, kind of all in one, and then a bedroom with a bathroom. Uh, but everything is just high end, really well done. And then outside the bed, outside the bedroom, there's a, like a porch here, a covered porch area that has, there's a bed out there that's like, you could go, you know, lounge day bed kind of thing. And then an outdoor shower. And an outdoor bathtub out there. And then the whole, you know, the whole thing opens to the valley, but then there's a curtain you could close there. And then a, a door out the back that goes to a little swimming pool out in the back. So we really kind of went high end with it. We'll see. Uh, the thesis is, is we should be able to rent it for like $700 a night. And, wow. And fill it up, but we'll see. That's really great. And who designed it? Didn't you hire somebody from, wh where were they from? Tell, from talk to us about that. So found yeah. on work, a Ukrainian architect that had fled Ukraine and was living in, I think in Georgia, um, and basically just trying to get work online. She was a fantastic architect that has worked really well. Um, and so, uh, you know, literally my wife and I would just sketch out ideas and send them over and then we'd get these just beautiful renderings back and we're moving things around and stuff and as we went. It's fun, you know, not all states are like this, but in Texas, if you're outside of an incorporated city, you need a development permit, that says you're going to build something there, but you don't need a building permit. You don't need something that actually like, you know, no one reviews building codes whatsoever. So I've got a fantastic contractor. So everything is safe and done really well, but you know, no one's out there kind of making you put in, you know, handicap ramps and different yeah. things. 
Are you on a septic you know, system or what? What uh, and had had to put a new one in, which is quite expensive. That was more than I had budgeted for. But okay, that's cool. Yeah. So, yeah. do you have more plans to do more of these, or is this a one-time deal and you're done? I don't know. Not on that property. This max is out. Kind of what you can do there. Um, but certainly would love to keep doing it. I don't know. I've got my eye on the neighboring parcel there. That's vacant. Let's see if I can buy that. I, it's hard because we've got this just wonderful contractor that I completely trust and does such good work. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I don't want to see him go work for somebody else. So yeah. we might just, we might just do another one. Do you get up there often? Or are you pretty involved in managing it or is it mostly your wife? One of us is out there at least twice a month. Okay. Um, but not, not super often we get texts. We're on like a group chat with the, um, with the contractor, Antonio, he'll send us, you know, picture late this morning, he was sending us the backsplash tile. Like, is this how you want it laid or is it, you know, it's the other way. And so that's, that's fun. Great. That's fun. Yeah. I want to wrap up here, Levi. I've got a ton more questions here that we didn't even get to at all, but I will want to do this quick fire round if you're up for it. No, let's do it. You good? All right. Okay. So number one question is, will Grant Cardone go bankrupt in the next three years? <laughs> I've often wondered this. Man, that V system, the way he's got stuff set up, I've looked, I've reviewed a couple of his deal and there is one clear winner and it's him. And I just can't believe that people are, are funding that madness. Um, will he go bankrupt? I doubt it because I do think he's done well at kind of silo. Maybe some of the projects will be a total loss. He's overpaid for a lot from, from the numbers I've seen. Maybe there will be some total loss projects, but I think he's built a, you know, a, a very efficient fee machine but it's that he's, he's hardly in the real estate business he's more in the you know in fee business right people don't quite understand that plus the value of the platform that he has and the money that he can generate off of how many to blindly follow what he's doing is amazing mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah not quite the the rapid fire answer but that's my long answer no it's good it's all good <laughs> what's uh what's your most um gifted book most gifted book essentialism yeah uh, super super good book um, I need to go read it again. I've read it twice and I need to go back and do it again. Just this idea that you can basically focus on the things that really matter and are really important and just allow other things to like, I'm just not going to do that. Like just the art of saying no, not interesting, doesn't get me where I want to go. So no, mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I saw that on your bookshelf. I thought that was one of them because you had a, you had a slew of essentialism and there was another, another stack of books that I couldn't tell what the book was, but there was another yeah. like several books that, that it looked like something that you would give to people as well. Yeah. What was, was there a second one at all? Um, I, I, you probably saw it. So the essentialism, there's a bunch of those up there. I wrote a book in 2012 yeah. Yeah. and I have a bunch of them on my shelf. It's funny. I didn't even think of that. I'm sure you could see that up there because there's a yeah. bunch of them. It's a green, it's a green book. Uh, I, yeah. Not the book I would write today. I feel like I was a very different person at the time, but that book was about the kind of journey that our family went through in Ethiopia, moving there and like what that was like to just kind of go move out in the middle of nowhere and start an orphanage and the struggles of local governments and working with local people and learning a culture and not knowing language and stuff. Is it the available actually, on, funny. is it available it's on, on Amazon? Amazon? Yeah. What's it called? It did, but it's called No Greater Love. Again, just not the book I would write today. So I don't really recommend it. Um, it was funny. It actually did really well at first. It was on the Amazon top bestsellers for memoirs. And it was like one in three, like the Kindle and regular version for like two and a half months. I mean, this thing was selling like crazy. Like it sold like 15,000 copies or something in the first. And then Amazon changed their algorithm. And literally the next day I checked and it wasn't even in the top. It was just gone. And, and sales just it killed it. Completely drop. Yeah, it's amazing how how much it'll drop. I, I saw on YouTube there's like a maybe a reading of it. Was was that a chapter oh, yeah. or there's something on there? No greater love that is. Yeah. So there was the publisher that we work with did get a company that um, basically did a, a audiobook version. So it's on Audible too. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I wanted to hear this one from you. What's what's a startup idea that you know would crush it, but you've never got around to launching it? <laughs> this is a tough one. Um, man, I don't know. I, I, it's funny. I actually score really low on the like 
creativity. I'm not like my wife is a lot more. She has a whole bunch of ideas that she's always got going. I, I'm much more like, here's how I can hear somebody else's idea and figure out how to actually make, turn that into action. And I have a very low like threshold for like, it's what go time is and it's, it's go time. I can go make it work. Mm -hmm. so, I do think there's a lot of potential in doing secondary LP transactions and creating some sort of platform where LPs basically who've invested in private, you know, equity deals, uh, real estate deals could go and say, Hey, I want out of this thing, but does anyone want to buy it? Here's all the updates. Here's all the financials. Here's everything that we've, you know, gotten so far. Does anyone want to buy my position? I need some money. I need it. You know, that, it often happens that, you know, people are kind of, they have a bunch of cash and they invest. And then later it's like, oh my gosh, now, you know, yeah. something changed in life. My wife died and I needed cash out. And, it, and that platform, a, a platform like that doesn't exist right now? Not that I have found. I mean, obviously it's just full of, uh, deeper I get into it, it's like, I don't know if it even could exist. It's full of issues because yeah. when you don't, when you don't have direct access to the GP to tell you exactly how things are going, most GPs would be like, that's not my job. I'm not going to facilitate this whole thing for you right there's questions as to kind of maybe the deal's done really bad or maybe it's done well it's tough to understand i think you had an yeah. idea that i liked it was like buying land outside of like a major city i don't know 60 miles right. out with and to, <laughs> like an rv concierge just on it i know right right i'll see it uh, like an RV, you know clean the rvs like store them 60 miles out drive them into the city when the people are ready yeah. for them i thought that was kind of interesting <laughs> But yeah, that was just, we were looking at uh, these kind of industrial outdoor storage and seeing what people are paying for RVs. Mm -hmm. Storage close into town and how much cheaper land is way out. Mm -hmm. You have somewhere like Austin where, you know, Austin and San Antonio are only an hour apart from each other, both massive cities. Mm -hmm. And you could literally just get some land that's, you know, dirt cheap, really, really cheap right in the middle and do something like that. I, yeah. I like it. Not, not so business for me though. Right, right. <laughs> Not part of the essentialism program, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Unessential. Um, la last one here. What does success mean to you? Um, man, that has changed a lot over the years. I have been just endlessly driven for forever, as long as I can remember. Um, and uh, over time, I've started to kind of, you know, I mean, it's weird. Dude. Kids are getting older. My youngest is 13. Uh, two of them are gone you know, in college already. And I look back and I don't remember much of the kind of business successes and millions of dollars that I've had in the bank, and, you know, from deals that have gone right or ones that have failed, but more the, you know, time that I was able to spend with my family and the kind of successes that they're having in life. I, yeah, certainly much, much more important. And yeah. I don't want to kind of, you know, die and have, and then then or you know get on my deathbed and then realize i wish i had spent more time there yeah so you've got two in college and two still at home two at home yep a 16 year old and a 13 year old so only one non-driver left in the house so and is that the one that play you've got one that plays chess i saw yeah our youngest uh 13 year old plays chess and just loves it yeah we her and i were playing a whole bunch of games back to back last night that's fun that's yeah. awesome Cool. Levi, Good this times. has been really fun. I really appreciate you taking the yeah. time to talk with us today. I really enjoyed hearing more about you. So many great adventures. Uh, I'd love to maybe have you back on because there's literally half the questions I didn't even get to. So um, <laughs> Sounds like fun. Let's yeah. See. So for, for our listeners that wanted to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what's, what's the best way for them to do that? Um, Twitter. At Levi James here is my Twitter handle. Uh, Harbor Capital is harborcap.com. Uh, we've got a place where you can sign up to to start seeing our deal flow on there. Uh, get to know us, and we can get to know you. Um, yeah, I I spend time on Twitter weirdly, even though it's kind of a strange place. But yeah, <laughs> it's a love hate relationship. It, it is absolutely. <laughs> Levi, this is great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. I would be just kind of bored looking up ways to maybe make additional income, make investments, because I didn't know about any of that stuff growing up. So all of my education from, I guess, investing in real estate was from podcasts and YouTube videos. So 
I'd listen to those on the way to work each day. 